All right, so it's always a pleasure to have my Decatur, Georgia brethren up up on camera to talk about all the amazing things you've been doing. Uh, I mean, you do you do amazing things off screen, but all the amazing things you've been doing on the screen. Um, big, I mean, big gear for you. I mean, you got some, some stuff that's falling into Emmy consideration. I mean, Queen Sugar's always hanging around those type of nominations, but I mean, with, with what happened with your characters uh, and uh, Genius, Rita Franklin, I mean, it just seems like it just seems like a, the momentum that that you started is, is to continue to build. So, first, just how does it feel to be in the in the consideration mix and being uh, recognized for for the great work you put in there? Uh, first of all, I want to say what's up to you, uh, Jamal. You know, you've been my brother for a long time. You know, what I'm saying my homeboy, my neighbor. You know, since we was little kids, man, proud of you and everything you're doing. Um, Thank you. But yeah, man, this has been a um, it was a very interesting year. Uh, Cause you know, last year we were dealing with COVID and, and all of that, we had to take five or six months off of filming. And so when I did Aretha, I started out early in like January or February of last year and didn't complete it until this year, which is very unusual. Um, yeah. But when I when I ended up watching it, it was, it, it was, it was sort of worth it. <laughs> and it was really good work. Um, you know, Cynthia is a darling, man, it's my sister. Uh, and Anthony Hemingway you just came in and, and, and did an amazing job. And Courtney B. Best, everybody in that cast and that crew, you know, was tremendous. You know, of course, uh, Susie Lord Parks, a uh, uh, tremendous writer. Uh, so, you know, it, and this feels really good. You know, I, I would do, you know, interviews or whatever, and everybody's talking about the any considerations. Uh, this is the first time, really, that I feel like, um, you know, it's, it's really a push. You know, I think Queen Sugar, we've been doing amazing stuff for, for five, six years now. Um, but outside of Queen Sugar, this is the first time that I've been hearing a lot of that. And when they see us, of course, the whole project, you know, yeah, had all the yeah. Emmy considerations, all the nominations, but I mean, it's personally, uh, you know, people talking about awards and that's, it sounds really cool. I you know you don't really do it for that. You just try to do it to be the best that you can be. But you know, the appreciation is, is, is very uh, heartfelt and it feels really good. Did staying with, with did the, having a delay and staying with that character for long than you may have, I mean, I know you've been, you know, with, the same on series regulars you you there with for years with, with one character but that did that help you get to know that character better as a as an actor sitting with it for for that dead space where you was waiting to shoot again and stuff is delayed and you still this character that you thought you'd be done with it did it change your performance at all when you came back to it it helped my piano playing because i had a whole six months to doing that but sitting in front of that piano uh you know I, i'm a church boy so i know james Cleveland. you know i know that character i know that man i know his life story and all of that i didn't know that he he and aretha were that close uh you know so i did do a little bit of reading about that do a lot of research about that uh and like i said just being able to have that much you had that much time free time sitting in the house on the quarantine, you better learn some skill. So, you know, I picked that piano up. I've been playing piano since I was a kid, but you know, I've been, I've been, when I went to performing arts school, I went to school to be a musician and I ended up being an actor. Uh, so yeah. I had to, you know, brush those skills off, but man, it was um, it was worth it. And I think the performance was there and, you know, me playing and even trying to sing a little bit, <laughs> you know, it, it was, um, yeah. yeah, it was well worth it. Yeah, darling, you see I'm putting grease on them chords. I see, I see. Uh -huh. You see, I take the sound in through my ear and let it flow throughout my whole body. Yeah. I let it work me. Put my back into it. Then I dig in. Yes, yeah. You gotta go head to head with these keys. You see me wrestling with it? I see. Uh-huh. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, now we feeling it. Thank you, my darling. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Which music you like better, gospel or pop? Do I gotta choose? You know, gospel folks think that pop is sinful. My daddy likes all types of music. Yeah, there ain't many preachers like your daddy. I want you to come out on the road with us this summer. On the gospel circuit? We could be friends. I didn't have a friend last time. Maybe. I'm gonna bring up a topic that seems to always come up around the wars times, especially when dealing with black actors. And it's it's just the 
the and this and this one's interesting too because right here you're you're paired alongside uh, Cynthia, who caught a lot of flack for playing um, Harriet Tubman, and people's like, oh, she's not Adol, she's not black enough, she's British black, whatever. But I mean, you've been on Selma, where David Oyelowo plays, you know, Martin Luther King. I mean, we just seen uh, Daniel Kaluuya play uh, Fred Hampton, and here you are, black American uh, actor from the South, could could to handle the the lingo, the language, knows it inside out. Do you, why do you think uh, those roles weren't given to somebody like you as as opposed to some of these British actors? Like, what what is the the secret sauce in that decision? Those casting decisions that we seem to see so so many British actors playing some of these roles that we would. A lot of people. I'm not gonna say we, but a lot of people hope would have went to somebody that's born right here in America. I think they feel like British actors are British actors, particular, not even African actors, not even island actors, but British black actors come with a prestige because of that goddamn accent. That means nothing to me. You know what I'm saying? And don't get it twisted. I think Daniel was tremendous. That's where it happened. I can't even lie about that. You know, Cynthia, I thought she was great. Hey, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote with Cynthia twice, and Harriet and in Aretha. I think she's a tremendous talent. You know, um, but I do think that the powers that be sometimes think that British actors don't have an affect on them because they're, you know, it's a little bit easy. I, I don't know. I think that's what they think. They don't have that affect, that slave blood or whatever it might be in them. So it might be, you know in the back of their minds, they're like, this is a little bit more prestigious. This is this, that, and the other. I mean, I know, I know the best American actors in the world, black American actors. I know them, I've worked with them, I've grown up with them, you know? Um, so there are times when I'm like, look, man, I'm, it doesn't, we can put somebody else, we can put other people in those roles. Now that's not to take anything away from the brilliant, um, uh, a thespians that we know we're talking about, about Daniel and, and, and David Oyelowo and, and, and Cynthia or, or a Gugu or whoever it might be, man, they're a tremendous actors. But uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, when you look at it, these people who are these high pillars uh, uh, of, of, of African-American life, uh, you know, the these people who we've been studying since we were children, Martin Luther King and, 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 and all of them, you know, it would, I mean, it would be great to have a crack at it, you know? And I think that, you know, sooner than later, you know, I think that we will be able to to, to have that crack at it. Yeah. You, you said something about you, you you know these actors, you grow up with these actors, and that brings me to my next question. I mean, Decatur, Georgia used to be the home of a lot of, you know, pro athletes, people that grew up and played high school sports and we end up seeing them in the Super Bowl or in the NBA right. or on the Olympic field. But now we're seeing whether it's, you know, Donald Glover or Mari Harvick or you. I mean, we see a lot it. of, yeah, yeah. A lot of people come out of there that's now uh, doing a lot of stuff on screen, which when we was growing up, I just don't remember it being as many, you know, neighbors that were like doing that type of work. Like, well, how has Atlanta and Decatur in particular become like, a bastion of uh, of talent for for on screen talent. You know, one thing about Decatur is that if your parents aren't from Atlanta, they move to that suburb of Decatur, right? So my parents aren't from Atlanta. Uh, Dorian's parents aren't from Atlanta. Erica Ash's parents aren't from there. You know, um, you you were able to get a nice house in a middle class neighborhood that was really black, that's safe, and that was really awesome, and so it was a gumbo, it was a melting pot of different people from different places, from the islands, from New York, from California, from Chicago or whatever. That's where the parents are from. And so they instilled a lot of things in us maybe that they wanted to do. And the arts was very strong when I was coming up. You know, we took the piano lessons and we did the, the plays at church. I went to Green Forest, we did the plays at church. So when you, it's, when, when, when it was, new people coming into an area, you create that culture. And I think that, you know, I, Donald, our childish, you know, parents, they, everybody, they, you know, they, they, they instilled in us, you know, something that, to push more. And you're talking about a middle-class family where it's not like a kid has to go at 15 years old, 15 years old, now you gotta go work, cause you gotta help with the family. It's like, you already have 
that that support where you can branch off and do many different things. So you can go and be an amazing athlete. You know, you can go and be Quincy Carter or you can go and, and, and be whoever you want to be future or whoever it is, because you have these different, you know, outlooks and you have these different outreaches that you have. Um, so that's why I think is specific about Decatur, Georgia. You know, um, most of the people who I know who are from Atlanta, whose parents are from Atlanta, their parents are from Atlanta, great, whatever it is, they either live on the south side or on the west side. Um, the east side was something totally different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, just as, I mean, we talk about black excellence. I see like a lot of, uh, there's a lot of like D1, high profile athletes now choosing HBCUs. And it makes me think about all the HBCUs we have and, and none of them that have like a real MFA film program. Or, should we have an HBCU film school, like a, a real branded, like this is a film school, this is this is like Tish or whatever. Do you right. think that would ever happen with, with any of these uh, great HBCUs that we have across the country? That would be amazing. You know, it really would. You know, I work a lot in the university systems. I work in Georgia State University. Uh, but I, my kids are going to HBCU. My daughter just graduated from Howard. My, my youngest is going to North Carolina a and uh, That's my hope. I work a lot at, with um, a good friend of mine. I don't know if you know Keith Bolden, but he's a professor at Spelman and he's an amazing actor. Um, and I go and speak to the classes at least a couple times a year. But that is my hope is to try to get an MFA program in the acting and try to even get an MFA program in film directing. We have a lot of programs that are acting specific and specifically to the theater, right? But not to the film where that, that industry is exploding. You, you know, we like I, like you said, we know we're from Atlanta. We've seen in the last 15 years, I moved to LA 17, 18 years ago, 18 years ago, because there wasn't enough work in Atlanta for, for a person who's trying to do film and television. Now, it's probably the number one market, number one place in America to shoot. So we need to have a feeder program within like, you know, the AUC uh, or, or, or FAM, but specifically in the AUC or in those, those uh, HBCUs that are in Atlanta, that they can go straight into, into production. Whether it's you're being a PA, learning the craft, that's what my youngest daughter is doing right now on Cherish the Day. Um, so we should have that program in place. I know Mackey, Anthony Mackey and I have been talking about it a lot. We're working on a couple of projects together. And we're saying that we are specifically going to put those PA roles and those assistance roles to HBCU uh, graduates. And that's, that, that's the hope that we want to have. Yeah, yeah. And you got to do it too, Jamal. Come on now. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I want to be a part of it. I definitely, uh, I've been trying to be a part of like different programs just to teach people all across America like media skills. But, but definitely, if any, if any program like that, I'm, I'm full support of it. I've always wondered like why it hasn't existed in in full. I mean, a lot of people get their skills. I mean, Morehouse obviously put out a lot, a lot of great actors and and somebody and like Spike Lee that you might have heard of. So I mean, it's not like <laughs> Like they don't come out of these places, but I mean, I, I just would, I just would like to see something be official that the younger generation is like, yo, I want to go to Morehouse Film School, I want to go to Spelman Film School, I want to go to Clark Film School, or Howard Definitely. Film School, and like let that be like something real. Um, when did you, I, I know you said you was doing you went you was doing music and uh, and theater at Avondale like performing art school, but when did it, that dream? I, I, I know Drumline was a big thing, but you you must have already been in the mix to be in that, you know, to get that cast and roll in drumline, when did that dream become, you know, I want to be on the big screen, I want to do this, is this something I want to do? You know, I was 18 or 19 years old uh, when I started doing professional theater at Seven Stages, at Jumundi Theater, you know these theaters in Atlanta. Um, but the people who I was working with was the Fame Arm Alami, the, the, the Thomas Bird the third, Thomas Jefferson Bird the third, maybe rest in peace. Uh, I was working with a lot of different amazing actors who were also doing movies. And so I was like, oh, that is the blueprint. I can go and do this. And then like, you know, Thomas, you know, T-Bird, of course, was doing all of Spike Lee's plays. And um, Famo was doing everything from Forrest Gump to, uh, to, to Drop Squad or whatever. So, and, and specifically, uh, uh, Famo was the one who really took me under his wing. 
I went to the premiere of, uh, I think I went to the premiere of Drop Squad or Sankofa. I went to the premiere of Sankofa with him. He was the second lead of that movie. And I'm like, this is the man who's teaching me. He was my acting teacher, you know, every Saturday. He wants to show me, you know, exactly what it is. And, you know, you also got to get into voiceover work, Omar. And you also got to get into this, Omar, you know, at 16, 17 years old. So I saw, I saw a reality there. And then the first movie I ever did was drunk, what was, uh, was actually a uh, road trip. I was 21 years old, you know, and that's a cult classic. The second movie I did, or the third movie I did, second movie I did with Joanna, that's a piece of crap. The third movie I did was Drumline. It's another cult classic. So I was like, okay, so it can be done. It can be done in this sphere. And then the, the next one was a boycott. I'm working with Clark Johnson and Jeffrey Bright and Terrence Howard and the Carmody Jogo. And I was like, okay, cool. So then that was the time I was like, it's time for me to pick up. <laughs> move my family to Beverly, like the Beverly Hill Billies, you know, and, and yeah. to see exactly uh, what I could accomplish. You know, even though, you know, we, we're, in, we're in our, um, uh, approaching our middle years or whatever, uh, all of us together, I feel like you and Ava DuVernay have kind of grown up in stature together where, I mean, when she, you know, first started Queen Sugar, I mean, every, all the, all the, uh, I was about to say when they see us, uh, um, all her first movies and stuff. I mean, she was still a, a, a young person as a director, and he right. began in Selma. People didn't really um, know much about her, but now she's this big firebrand. She's an icon. She has, Iconic. you know, dolls made made uh, made out of her and everything else. Like, um, how has it been to be along for that ride? Um, not only with uh, Queen Sugar, but with Selma, and just see like where she's where she's gone from where she was she's changed the industry jamal before her i had three female directors i've ever worked with after her i've had 50 or 60 because only females direct queen sugar and then i do harriet with uh with um uh, 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 uh casey then i go and do uh aretha and i'm working with nima barnett you know it's so there is no reason that women should have been shut out as long as they were and in, in, in that career of directing. There's no reason. It's half men and half women in this world. It shouldn't be all men. It shouldn't be all directors or men. That's preposterous and that's sexist. She was the one who single-handedly changed that with putting all female directors as a director on her show. Now, all of these different directors that I see from that show, man, Julie Dash? Come on, man, she could direct Daughters of the Dust. It took her another 10 years before she could do something else? That's that's insane. Vic Mahoney, uh, Sally Richardson, you know, Whitfield, I'm sorry, uh, Dondre Kim, if I didn't put the Whitfield on there. Um, <laughs> but all, all of these amazing directors, Crystal Roberson, all of these tremendous female directors that we see and that who have become a part of the, of the filmmaking zeitgeist now, it's a, they have a big appreciation, they, they have a big, uh, uh, it's, 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 I don't wanna say uh, mainly, but it's a huge thing that Ava did because she was the one who put it in people's face. Like, this is what we need to do. You know, we need to have female, there's not just black women directors, it's female directors. So I think that is her legacy outside of producing and directing maybe the greatest uh, mini series of all time and when they see us, you know what I'm saying? But like, she's done these things, man. And you know, I, I still ride with her, I'm, I'm gonna say, I, Look, I shadow, I shadow her, and I shadow Paul Garns, as I said, her, her part, producing partner, because you know, in my, you know, get into my own producing, I want to see how it's done. So when they out there shooting Naomi, the uh, the, the 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 new uh, series on um, CW, you know, black superhero, you know, black female kid superheroes, almost stop with Superman, I'm there shadowing, watching, because I like man, she, the stuff that she's doing. It's, 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 it's all the way to the moon, man. And, and I'm a big, I, I look, man, I ride for her. I'm a ride or die. Ava family member, and she knows that. And I know that the same way as uh, that I am to her, so yeah. And uh, last question, because I know we're running out of time, but is there just some biopic that that, that would be, that you got your mind on? Uh, uh, is there any character in particular that you're like, yo, I wish I could just take on this character? I know you could probably do probably like 20 different people and, and do and do them justice, but is there somebody in particular that you got your eye on that you want to portray? Yeah, there is, and, and I'm gonna text it to you. <laughs> but, a, but there, I'll text it to you and I'll let you know, uh, you know what I'm saying? 
it, it's sort of in, it's in the works now. But there's a few people I want to play. I want to play Paul Robeson. You know, he's a football player, opera singer. That's me. You know what I'm saying? I uh, yeah. love to play Thelonious Monk. I would love to play. Uh, it's a lot of different people, man. It's just a lot of different um, biopics. Not a lot, but there are enough. I'm too tall to play Marcus Garvey, but good God, I would love to play him. You know, um, King Oliver, uh, the, uh, the the man who almost created jazz but outside of Buddy Bolden, who was uh, Louis Armstrong's teacher. It's a lot of people. You know, it's a lot of that has to do with music because I'm, you know, yeah. I, I think I'm a musician, but uh, <laughs> in my heart of hearts, I think I'm a musician. But yeah. That's true, man. We'll be looking out for for everything you got coming down on screen. I mean, good luck this this award season. And no matter what happened, you know what I'm saying? You deserve the honor of just putting in those great performances. We proud of you. Uh, keep on watching and be a big fan. And whatever you want to, want to drop that album. Let's do it, boy. We're going to bring it straight from the deck. Straight, bring it straight back to the crib. <laughs> DJ uh, Edward J. We gonna... <laughs> hey, you know, I used to date his daughter back in the days, man. Oh, that's that's crazy. Yeah, All back right, in the high school, man. she's going to high school with me. So, yeah, yeah, man. Appreciate the time, bro. Take it easy. All right, brother. All right, man. Talk All to right. you again, Jamal.